Okay, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sabrina Kofer, and on behalf of CHOICE and Toward Inclusive Excellence, I'd like to welcome you to today's program, Inclusive and Ethical AI for Academic Libraries. Today's session is part of Toward Inclusive Excellence, or TIE, a content strand from CHOICE that explores issues of equity, diversity, and inclusion in and outside of higher education of the higher education community. If you'd like to receive updates about new blog posts, resource lists, and podcast episodes, please use the links in the chat to sign up for our newsletter and to read the Thai blog. And I'll just put those in the chat for everyone. And I also included a link to a Thai resource list on ethical and inclusive AI. So before we get started, before we get started, I'd like to point out just a few features of the webinar software. So all of the attendees who join the presentation are automatically muted and your cameras are off. So don't worry about generating any noise or feedback. We've got that taken care of for you. Uh, we are using the Q&A feature today. Please use it to ask questions of our speakers and to submit any comments. Uh, we do expect many questions and we likely will not have time to get to all of them. So we apologize in advance for that. That being said, we'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. So please do type your questions into the Q&A module as they occur to you. You can also use the upvote feature to highlight questions you like or would like to be addressed. Also, there is closed captioning available for today's session. To toggle the automated captions on or off, please use the CC button on the bottom right corner of your screen. Last, please note that we are recording today's program and everyone who registered should receive a follow-up email with a link to the archive version. And with that, we are ready to get started. So I will hand it over to Alexia hudson Ward, Ty's Editor-in-Chief and our moderator for today. Thank you, Sabrina, and welcome to all of our participants for this important conversation on inclusive and ethical AI for academic libraries. As Sabrina shared everyone, the hosting entity for today's panel discussion is Choices Publishing's three-year-old vertical Toward Inclusive Excellence, or TIE for short. I'm proud to serve as Toward Inclusive Excellence Editor-in-Chief and also to report to you that more than 3,000 people registered for this webinar, making it one of the most popular webinars in Choice Publishing history. Many thanks to the outstanding group of experts and choice reviewers who contributed to our first Ethics and Artificial Intelligence Resources Guide. Sabrina has pasted that link into the chat, and we'll make sure to share it with you again and encourage you to bookmark this really great list. To keep up with Toward Inclusive Excellence's weekly content, make sure that you subscribe to our newsletter, and follow us on X, formerly known as Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, TikTok, YouTube, and Threads. If you plan to contribute to the real-time digital discourse on social about today's panel discussion, please use the hashtag TIEWebinar. Again, capital T, capital I, capital E, webinar. We also ask for your patience and your grace as we may encounter some technological issues during our webinar today. Please know that we will address the matter as soon as we can. I'm thrilled to facilitate our discussion and introduce these three outstanding leaders who in addition to their expertise in AI for academic libraries, have years of experience with emerging and integrative technologies, data science, and critical information literacy in machine manipulated environments. We will place their bios into the chat. Kareem Bohita is the Dean of University Libraries at Stony Brook University. Kim Nayer is the Edward Cornell Law Librarian, Associate Dean for Library Services and Professor of the Practice at Cornell University. Keith Webster, is the Helen and Henry Posner Jr. Dean of the University Libraries at Carnegie Mellon. Kim, Kareem, and Keith, thank you so much for joining us today. I have three questions and there may also be some additional that I'll pose to you and I'll rotate who I'll ask to respond to the questions. We have approximately 35 minutes for this portion of the webinar to leave time for all of our colleagues to ask questions as many as possible. 
So my first question is to Kareem. I read a great definition, Kareem, for inclusive AI on LinkedIn that identified it as, quote, the practice of designing and developing artificial intelligence systems that respect and represent the diversity of human values, cultures, identities, and abilities. So Kareem, as someone who has situated inclusivity within the libraries in which you've led, what can library team members and leaders do today to ensure that we are advancing and supporting inclusive AI within our libraries and on our respective campuses? Thank you, Alicia, and thank you for the invite. Um, I'll start with the story, a little bit story. Um, it was in the news uh, within a few weeks. So uh, Ari Page and Elon Musk, whether we like him or not, that's another story. So they had a fight. So uh, Larry Page was in favor of uh, new digital life forms. And Elon Musk was in favor of the human century they are. And then they literally split. And then it seemed that Larry called Elon, you're a species. I didn't know that word actually. I think that's one of the reasons I one of the reasons he created OpenAI. Why I'm saying this because we do care about humans. And that's an important, as librarians, archivists, and museum specialists, we put human first. And our goal in terms of AI is augmenting human intelligence and not replacing it. So that's an important stand in terms of ethic, ethical principles. That's one thing. Um, and AI in libraries, in theory, it should be kind of logical evolution, but it didn't happen. And one of the reasons actually is what we may call uh, ethical paralysis or ethical inertia. At some point, like whenever I have conversation with my colleagues and library leaders, they said because of ethical concerns, we have issues means we do nothing. That's what happened, actually. It's, it's unfortunate. On the corporate world, it's another thing. They do ethics washing. Because, and Google is a good example where they create an ethical team and then they dismantle it and they fire these people. And Tim Nidgeber is a, a good example of, of what happened there. So in our world, so I truly believe AI is very transformational and could help us really serve our community. So I had in mind to create AI services in my former university, University of Rhode Island. And I had conversation with students, faculty, provost, president office, and they were all on board. Even if some initially said, really? AI in the library didn't make the connection because they have that kind of old fashioned view of, of the library, but they were open to it. And the first person I contacted was a professor of ethics. And she said, yes, immediately without thinking. She saw the importance of the ethics. And when we built the AI services, we had in mind the two big buckets, the ethics and societal impact and the technical side. So we create programs basically more for students, all the machine learning, NLP, the robotics, uh, you name it. And we have also programs around how you interact with those, what's the impact on society. And you notice it's something. When we do ethical AI, we get low attendance. When we do super technical, we get more people and mainly whites. And for ethical, we have women and people of color, which is interesting. And also we noticed that when you create the AI lab, we were intentional, we said, because AI labs are perceived as kind of white space. If you have just kind of it's a lab and people, especially women or people of color won't be kind of, why am I gonna be in this space? 
So we hire student people of color. We're working with all, like, whenever we can, we have, like, whether sex, gender, and race. So a year later, literally, the student adopted the space. And they said, this is our space. And in terms of just a few things, like decoration or music, and we have also the other lab, Innovation Lab, Makerspace, they change the culture. And also when we hire also people with different background, they influence decision, they influence the way you work with AI. So that was crucial. And here at Stony Brook, I had many conversations and it's, it's more AI ready than my former campus because of so uh, focus on AI. So now we're involved more than that. We'll do, we're involved in AI governance, we're involved in AI guidance for the whole campus, which is a good role for the university. Yes, absolutely. Cool. I agree with that. And I want you to put a pin in that because I want to come back to it, but I also want to get Kim and Keith's perspective in here. Um, so Kim, I'm going to turn to you and ask, you know, how should library leaders and staff start preparing and supporting inclusive AI within their libraries and within their respective institutions? Really interested in hearing your thoughts as well. And thank you, Kareem, for opening us up. Well, thank you. And um, thanks to Kareem for some of those points. And as he pointed out, you know, often we think of tech spaces or a I spaces as spaces for maybe white men or men in general, um, and and de definitely a thinking of the technology first and the other issues later. And I think what we can do in in as library leaders um, is encourage all of our staff to um, not build up an artificial wall here when it comes to this. This is not. IT's concern. This is not for those guys to deal with. This is life. This is learning. And all of us have to learn more and become more involved. I think as leaders, we, uh, and you'll hear this from me, I think a few times today, is we need to encourage all of our staff members to, um, to get a bit hands-on and to learn more, to overcome any kind of a, a fear or a tech anxiety that we might have when it comes to AI and to learn more about how some of these tools and products, particularly generative AI, but even before generative AI products. Um, one of the books that I read back um, in the previous decade uh, was a book by Professor Frank Pasquale um, called The Black Box Society. And that really you know, enlightened me to how much AI and, and data affects daily decision-making that we are just simply not aware of and how much of that um, AI is not ethical and is not inclusive and wasn't built or designed with any of those concepts in mind. So I think, you know, that that is one thing that we can do is just inform ourselves and get involved. Thank you so much, Kim. And the same question to you, Keith. So how should leaders and staff be thinking about um, how to support inclusive AI within our respective libraries and within our institutions? Like, what are some of the tips and tools people should be thinking about grounding now? Sure, well, thanks, Lex, and good afternoon, everyone. I, I think Kim made probably the, what I would say is the quick answer, that is ensuring that everyone in the libraries has the opportunity to experiment, to learn, to understand what drives some of these ethical issues. Um, to me, inclusive AI is a, a subfield of ethical AI, uh, where we're focused on creating systems that are non-discriminatory, non they are not biased, they're accessible to everyone, and that they benefit all members of society. And we need to make sure that we're not inadvertently or intentionally, heaven forbid, excluding minority, marginalized, underrepresented groups. And... I think it's generally understood that traditional AI systems, and let's remember this is a field that has been around for 70 years, can perpetuate and amplify existing societal biases um, leading to discrimination and unfair outcomes for many in society. But I think if we reflect upon our traditional ethics and values in libraries, we have a ready-made frame of reference 
to do the right thing. And that is ultimately what this is about. You know, we, it's important to understand the issues, but we shouldn't overthink the fact that we want to do right for everyone who is in our community. And while we hope for a, a wealthier and more productive future with AI, there is still a long way to go before everyone is equipped with the knowledge and skills to reap its benefits. And to me, one of the priorities, not just for our colleagues, but for our communities, is ensuring that general AI literacy is seen as something that is really part of our library outreach efforts, whether we are in a university library, a public library, a K-12 school library, or any other public-facing library system. We have a responsibility to provide education to our communities and to our colleagues. Uh, it, it's quite clear that AI is rapidly transforming the landscape of everything, but in our context, universities and academic libraries. And we can begin to see that touching many functions of our activity, things like literature search and recommendations, predictive modeling of demands for collections and materials, chatbots, and virtual assistants instead of human reference services, automation of routine tasks. And there are lots of things to think through about how we can counter some of the potential downside. A large part of that is conversation and training. The final point I'll make is, you know, I, I'm incredibly fortunate being in a university that has a huge amount of AI activity underway. And um, ensuring that we take advantage of the trainings and web events offered on our campuses is an important upskilling opportunity. The great thing of the pandemic has been the general acceptance that events like the one we are participating in just now are openly available beyond any particular geography. And so we can learn from each other. And that's a, a tremendous opportunity to ensure that we are all as upskilled as possible. Thank you so much for all of these wonderful points, Keith, Kim, and Kareem. I wanna build on something that all three of you said, and many colleagues have heard me talk about this at nauseum, is the importance of reskilling, upskilling, you know, however we define it. Yet in many of our institutions and even within our respective libraries, what does that look like from a professional development perspective? Like how does, a respective library or one of our colleagues, how should they take on something as big as upskilling or reskilling um, for the age of AI? So I want to start with Kareem and then I'll go to Keith and Kim for responses. Yes, really good question. And it was actually, I was at, uh, I was invited at Charleston Conference a month ago and it was one of, one of the topic. And we work with the Sage Technologies and Skill Type, which is a talent management system for libraries. And they did a survey and the survey results were not that good really, because there was a disconnect between library director and leaders and professional staff. Professional staff had kind of in terms of priorities included digital scholarship, data science, but from directors, the, Actually, it's embarrassing. They mentioned LibGuide, Microsoft. No. Well, not the leaders here. So, <laughs> right? That's so, the thing. That's the thing. We present just, like, company excluded. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I don't know this kind of um, ignoring the landscape, what's going on. AI is very invasive, pervasive. And since ChatGPT, I Ch think, changed a lot. Which is an issue because people will do kind of grassroots movement to get to that AI thing, but if they don't get support from supervisor, if they don't get support, like to have because you need to carve out some time to do upscaling and do your regular job, which means it's okay if you do less of that job because you need to catch up on things. That's the dilemma that people are facing, and it was clear in that survey. Yeah, thank you. Um, Keith, what are your reflections around like how should 
a, a library or individuals start with upskilling or reskilling in the age of AI? Uh, I, I take a lot of comfort from what I'm seeing in the press generally that there are all sorts of horror headlines. We're all going to be disembodied by AI. Our jobs will go. They pose a profound risk to society. But what I think we're all finding is that our colleagues are curious. They are generally optimistic, if, if critically inquiring, and they are confident about the arrival of AI. And I do think that we can help our employees make a transition from concern to informed perspectives if we give them the time, the resources, and the opportunities. Uh, it's important, as I've said already, that our colleagues get a chance to interact with technologies and use them. You know, We don't want to stop experimentation or, or constrain effort. So for example, uh, this summer we had our annual summer off-site retreat and we had a number of colleagues from relevant bits of Carnegie Mellon, people working in hardcore AI, people working in ethics and AI, to come and present their work and to have an open conversation. And, and that was tremendously helpful to get us all to the same starting point. I'm conscious that a number of us have been in and around AI for a long time. For others, their exposure to that point had been the horror stories in the press. And then we had a, a further um, off-site retreat during our um, fall break week, where we had hands-on activities. We encouraged everyone to bring a laptop or mobile device, and we walked through exercises, things like planning a dinner party, writing invitations for family events, as again, something we can all understand and appreciate the pros and cons of some of the technologies. The other thing we do at, at Carnegie Mellon is give every employee in the library, staff and faculty, a, um, a, a generous professional development fund, a four-figure amount which they can use at, at their discretion. But we've also topped that up with a separate AI fund, and we are encouraging everyone to find a relevant AI-focused event, whether it's a conference, a webinar, something else, and, and we are guaranteeing the funding and the time. Quite simply, we need to give everyone the permission and the encouragement so that their skills are developed, so that in turn, our most critical mission, supporting our faculty, staff, and students around the university, can be enriched by an awareness and understanding of, of the issues around AI that we wish to convey from our distinctive perspective. Yeah, thank you. And the same question to you, Kim, like how should an individual or an organization take on the enormous task of reskilling in the age of AI? What should or could that look like? So those are some excellent initiatives that Keith, uh, at Carnegie Mellon, congratulations, Keith, on those. And I mean, I'd, I'd love for us to steal some of those. Um, I think uh, I definitely agree that now is the time to enhance professional development budgets to um, allow people to learn in areas that are meaningful to them. Um, I think, you know, what we can also do, that those of us who have some famil familiarity with resources, so the Thai blog has this wonderful list of resources, is, you know, sharing things like that. Um, we've had with uh, at the law school we, among librarians and faculty, we've had a couple of lunchtime workshops where we will share um, some resources and some learnings um, from others. And among the law librarians, we've done the same. You know what I, I haven't done yet, but I, I like the idea of is a small, um, very informal research and knowledge sharing groups or, or reading and knowledge sharing groups. So a short article someone picks like an informal seminar among colleagues, um, sharing ideas and asking questions. I love the idea of the retreat that you mentioned, Keith, to um, I think, you know, engagement within our communities and helping again, helping um, all staff recognize that this, this isn't just something for someone else. So, you know, we will hear staff say, um, or oh, this is just, you know, the, the latest wave, it's like blockchain again, or something like that. But I, I think people are, are understanding that um, so, so much of the existing and historical AI of recent 
years or recent decades has been almost invisible in the way we do our work or has been implemented so gradually in many of the tools that we use that we're not even recognizing that we're getting results sent to us based upon past use and, and recommendations. Um, so I think that is really important. And for those who are more actively engaged in teaching, I think um, finding ways to educate in a, in a very, um, you know, get, creating a baseline understanding of what an LLM is and what uh, machine learning means and what, what they don't mean. So it's easy to get very caught up in the hype and get excited or to get afraid because of the hype, but to be able to, um, you know, the, and there have been some really great resources, short guides that are, you know, like a five day course that the New York Times, for example, put out back in the spring, which is really great for helping people have a baseline knowledge of what, what goes on with ChatGPT, for example. Yeah, thank you so much. And all of you raised the ethical concerns and, and ethics and, and inclusivity and relationship to AI having some connectivity or one is a subset of the other. And so Kim, actually my next question is to you as we pivot our conversation to talk a little more about ethics. And so as a lawyer and a librarian who has written on this topic, how should library staff and leaders be thinking about and preparing to address ethical um, dilemmas that are AI related? So thank you for this question. And as you alluded to, I have been thinking about this for some time and it, you know, things have concerned me for a decade or more in, in the way we've just, as a society, gradually shifted into donating our data, our personal knowledge and having that commodified and then developed. And we've seen, you know, developed into tools that often we end up having to buy back. Um, and so that's something that's really bothered me, but I think, I think there is an ethical problem there, but quite often we've got um, this conflict between um, libraries, which are now very, very tech heavy. So to be a librarian, to work in libraries, you need to work with technology a lot. And then the tech industry um, and conflicting values. Like you hear this refrain over and over again about moving fast and breaking things um, in the tech industry, whereas librarians, we ought to be slowing down and checking and critically evaluating what we're doing. And I, I think that's where we end up getting this ethical conflict often is we're working in an environment where the things around us are moving so fast that we can either get tempted to get caught up in that and want to move along with it, with things to be informed about the latest tools and products or to be in on that progress. Um, but we often, forget that you know we wouldn't have some of the ethical problems that we do with machine learning with data driven systems even with llms that we do now had the um as it's referred to i think in that unesco report the ai pipeline everything every stage involved in the process had somebody turned their attention to the ethical issues earlier on in that process we wouldn't be where we are and i think it's a, it's important again for um, those of us working in libraries to recognize that and take steps that we can do. So, you know, we can educate our users. Um, I was inspired by Joan Donovan, who until recently worked um, at the Harvard Kennedy School. And, you know, her, her phrase of 10,000 librarians is what the world needs to counter all of the misinformation that is on the internet. And that is misinformation, of course, or disinformation is only exacerbated by AI, by algorithms that push things up to the top or by generative AI that can produce um, very, uh, you know, it, misinformation that's very dif difficult to distinguish from, from good quality information. And, and I do think that now more than ever is actually the time for library professionals to get involved in this kind of um, emphasis of critical evaluation and so that is part of our ethical responsibility. It's part of our role as, as librarians. And there's a real need for it with our, within our patron communities as well as with the public at large. Thank you so much, Kim. And colleagues, we'll make sure to get you the links to the UNESCO report that Kim referenced in her response. It is fabulous. And UNESCO is really taking on this notion internationally around 
ethical AI and what we can do now to make sure that we are fortifying our organizations in relationship to ethical practices. Um, Keith, I want to turn to you with the same question. So how should we be thinking about and preparing to address this? It's a litany, right, of AI-related ethical dilemmas. So what are your thoughts? Uh, I, I have lots, as you might expect. Let, let me just frame this um, a little bit before I answer your question. I, I think there are a lot of concerns out there about the wave of large commercial LLMs that have emerged, particularly over the past 12 months. And you know, I'm, I'm reminded that last week was the first birthday of ChatGPT3, and that really was the beginning of a, of a tidal wave. And one of the big concerns that, that many of us have is that we don't have a clear sense of what those LLMs have been trained on. We, we've got a, a decent guess, but we truly don't know what's in, what's out. And therefore, if we are using these models for work-based activities, can we be sure that we have adequate representation of the breadth of knowledge? Have we excluded particular aspects of content and, and such things? So th th that is a, a particular concern. The other one, and, and this maybe is a little bit political, but when I look at the development of artificial intelligence over the past 30, 40 years, going through a, a couple of AI winters, I'm conscious that for the first 35 of those 40 years, so roughly from the early mid 80s, almost all developments took place in university and government facilities. Over the last five years, the tilt has been almost exclusively to for-profit corporations, the, the obvious ones like Google, Microsoft, OpenAI, um, because they have the computing power and the financial resources to build these LLMs and also, frankly, to recruit the top talent from universities. It's become an incredibly competitive landscape. So it, it, it's just shifted the nature of what AI is. Um, some of my colleagues are offering a prognosis that we will actually see a downsizing away from these large commercial LLMs as a combination of public sentiment and government regulation moves things towards startups to smaller LLMs. But even then, I can see some, some concerns. Google would quite happily let me build a personal LLM. And the trade-off for me is that I have to expose all of my Gmail, all of my Google Docs to be the knowledge base. Am I comfortable doing that? I might be, but how would I advise one of my library patrons? is an interesting question. But for, for us specifically in libraries, I, I think we recognize issues of bias and discrimination in algorithms. We need to be critical about any algorithms we use, think about measures to mitigate bias, ensuring we're using diverse data sites, maybe having a, a, you know, some sort of human oversight. In, in companies, it's common to have some sort of AI oversight board, maybe in our libraries, as we see greater offerings of AI products from vendors and publishers, we need some sort of AI committee to ensure that we are comfortable professionally, that ethics are being observed, that our values are being upheld. The same thing can play out across issues to do with privacy and security, accessibility. You know, it, it's evident, of course, that these technologies take place on a digital landscape. And we know that there are issues of accessibility to systems for those with disabilities. There are equity issues around the digital divide. Um, we'll talk, I, I know, later on about job displacement, um, transparency in everything we do. And, and for those of us in a university environment, that is another part of our institutional values being open and clear about what we're doing. So that, almost a random shopping list, but those are the things top of mind that I really feel we need to be embracing in conversations like the one today and in our libraries. Yeah, thank you, Keith. And Kareem, the same question to you. So what should we be doing now within libraries on our respective campuses to address the scores of AI-related ethical dilemmas? I think uh, what we lack is action. 
because we talk too much and we don't do much. And then back to the ethics inertia I mentioned earlier. Um, and also there was a good conversation at the last uh, hour, at last session of research libraries, where um, Anadian seemed to be more practical and they said, okay, let's move from ethics to policy where ethics is more like a, a moral conversation, a theoretical frameworks, and let's do policy making. And this is a fast moving thing, and that's okay. You're gonna make policy, you're gonna break it. Even EU, when they did, they think this was before Gen AI, and they realized, well, now it's almost obsolete. That's okay, do it again. So I think action is extremely important. I'm pushing for this for a long time. You need to start, you need to experiment. You need to allow failure. You need to allow people to try new things and also focus on things we can control. We don't control LLMs of OpenAI. We don't control many of those. We don't, and the publisher are working on it. They're gonna create their own private LLMs. Do we have control? No but we need to know how to negotiate. We need to have our voice so we can have those principle and the AI principle in that because we're, we're the customers. And some of them are paying attention. So because they if they don't pay attention to this, then they're gonna lose customers. So um, I'm really tired of kind of people not doing even the minimal thing because you could create on, on the low budget services, allow your people to experiment, get them trained. And you don't need to be like coder or computer scientist. You can do these things. And I've seen even actually the top research universities, they didn't do much. If we compare to even small public universities, there are some who, who did something like this and kind of tried to fight. And also our high level in terms of like AI guidance. That's our strength. We give we give training, we give um, instruction around privacy, around information literacy, data literacy. We can influence decision. We can influence even our legislators. Actually, Stanford took the lead of training legislators because they have no clue what AI is. So that will be our role. Also, public libraries. I know many of them don't have, they can barely survive, but they can influence local legislators in terms of AI because that's where people are. Yeah, thank you so much, all three of you, for this uh, really great conversation. My last question is for Keith, although all of us in this dialogue have been alluding to the fears and concerns among our colleagues about how generative AI will impact our current and future work. And among some of the biggest concerns that I've heard vocalized center around job elimination. You know, what are the plans for skill development? And then what will AI-enabled automation look like within our libraries? And so Keith, as someone who has operationalized several new technologies within academic libraries, what's your advice on how we can successfully navigate change and also reduce fears that accompany incorporating more AI tools within our work? Let, let me begin with this story. Since Karim did that earlier, I was uh, at a, a CMU event with um, several hundred alumni last week in Seattle, and one of my colleagues was talking about these issues. So this was a, a prominent social scientist, and he said, look, I can carve nice sentences when I write, but ChatGPT can do it better. I can It can code better than me, and candidly, my skills have lost value in the past year. And I think that's a, a very real situation for those who are involved in works of creativity. We've seen that play out in Hollywood, for example. Um, I think it's really interesting to, to step back and think about librarianship as a, a professional practice. And I can see there are perhaps a couple of possible futures for the impact of AI on the professions. The, the first is a more efficient 
version of what we have done, what we do today. That is, AI will streamline and optimize our traditional ways of working. I can have my email system summarize a long email so that I can hopefully get through my inbox more quickly. But the second future that I could imagine is one that is very different, and, and that is where increasingly capable systems and machines gradually take on more of the tasks that we associate with the work that has traditionally been in the domain of librarianship. Perhaps it, it, it's unfortunate that often we think about our work as a, a monolithic, I'm a librarian, period. Uh, but And when we think top down in terms of jobs, it's almost thinking about what is the tipping point where AI is going to put me out of a job. But instead, if we break down our work into its composite tasks and activities, what we can find is that there are things that are relatively routine and can be automated accordingly, freeing up our time to do more of the things that require us to be human or expert. And I, I situate a lot of my thinking as a leader in, in that conversation. And I do think there is a just a, a passing observation I've alluded to this already, um, that where we see more and more practical expertise made available online, um, tax preparation, for example, or a chat service answering reference questions, uh, who is the gatekeeper for that? You know, in a sense, in a profession, we have had our professional bodies serving as a gatekeeper, setting out professional ethics and standards of practice. When all of that shifts online, who is the gatekeeper? Uh, ultimately, I, I do think it comes down to a recognition that we need to engage in a lot of training, as, as we've said several times this afternoon. And the sort of thing that, that, that I'm evolving here is, is you know, a recognition of the, the work that we've done already uh, to an extent or, or started, that is giving everyone some introductory opportunities uh, Hopefully you've seen, I dropped into the chat, the questions that we used um, to help people just try out BARD and ChatGPT for their own fun. But then moving beyond that hands-on training to thinking about how, as an organization, we're going to strategically think about adopting AI. What are the tasks, as opposed to the jobs, that we think we can complement or improve with the use of AI? And how do we help people develop the skills to work with the assistance of some sort of intelligent agent? And then going beyond that into building confidence, not just, I feel comfortable using this, but I am confident in this AI system's performance and articulating our approach to our community of users. I think these are, are sort of important tasks. And as, as always, remembering the importance of assessment, thinking about pre and post training service to measure how far we and our colleagues have come, um, thinking about the expected outcomes around increased knowledge and understanding how we're going to reduce fear and anxiety. Um, I, I really think that for leaders, these are, are the important aspects of the conversation. We need to help our people make that transition from concern to optimism, because the potential payback from effective deployment, and I, I think of another bit of my job here at Carnegie Mellon around sustainability and advancing the, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, estimates are we could make um, advanced progress on 80% of the SDGs I, I read somewhere if we deploy AI effectively. These are, are big wins, but we need to ensure that we have the skills to do it. Yes, thank you for that. I wanna now turn to Kareem and then Kim, and then after your responses, we'll open it up to some questions. How do we help our colleagues navigate the change? Because you know, I agree absolutely training and strategies and relationship to training makes a lot of sense. Yet, you know, people are human and we're made up of all the organic things that that humanness brings, including some fears and concerns around the disruptive manner of AI. 
So Kareem first and then Kim secondly, how do we help people think about and navigate the change? You know, in terms of jobs, I get this question frequently. And after Gen AI, I answer it differently. I'll tell you why. I shared yesterday in a social media study, peer review study about the impact of jobs and library jobs were rated 19, which means we're in top 20. And even when I got this question, I said, you're safe for the next 15, 20 years. And one, one of our colleagues, Leo Lohr from the University of New Mexico, he shared some of this result of his survey and one, one of the response was, in the future, only rich research libraries can afford humans, which is interesting. So the anxiety is real, real, but for the time being, I think if you want to survive and thrive, we have to work with AI, you cannot avoid it. And upskilling, reskilling is extremely, extremely important. And as library administrator, we have to enable people to try new things for their professional development. When you have that right environment, like here, I mean, our people, are, start to experiment and initially I didn't tell them like do this like our coders they they know like you know in terms of like chat GPT will kind of enhance your code or you get the first code some other libraries are literally using LLMs they dump the um, basically the uh, legal document for like um, for vendors to get them a sense of what's what's important and what's not. So it's helping technical services, metadata mm -hmm. enhancement. This, the sky is the limit in terms of what they should do. But I think the first thing is realizing it's important. I think we didn't get that yet. And when you realize it's important, then you do your best in terms of like optimizing your resources. And the low level of AI is optimizing what you have now, let alone going into a new realm, like what's the future of libraries? That's another thing we didn't think about. What is the future of our job? How we would interact? Because like, are we working with those AI in terms of everything, kind of first level of support? Probably. So, but we need kind of prepare the environment so we can have those conversations and have open conversation because some people are scared and some people are yes. open, which is which is legit because with Gen AI before, actually, there was a study done literally eight years ago. They scrapped all job description from the Department of Labor in DC and they ran an algorithm. And I remember, so I put library in archivist and the chance of surviving within the next 20 years was 50%. Mm -hmm. And teacher was 70%. And now it's lower because of Gen AI, where Gen AI now has that level of creativity. We thought like low level workers or tech workers or blue collar jobs will suffer like truckers. Didn't happen. Now it's knowledge workers who are going to be impacted. So right. there, yeah. there was a shift. Yes, thank you for that point. And Kim, if you could uh, lead us in the last point on this question around how do we help our colleagues and our entities, our libraries and our respective institutions navigate the change that comes with AI? Well, I I want to echo that I do believe that this is, I mean, the, the change is real. Um, I see the legitimacy of concerns about particular job functions. Um, you know, I my specialization is in the law library, and I gave a very similar presentation about on this about a year ago or half a year ago to uh, recent alumni of our law school. Um, and you know, <laughs> this is moving fast in the legal industry. So the legal information profession, the legal profession is very text heavy. So we've got soft our traditional legal re research databases. Um, the, the key ones have now got um, LLM components and generative AI components in them. They're not fully released to the schools yet or, or on the market yet, 
but they are there. And in fact, we just had a presentation yesterday. The librarians just had a presentation yesterday from one of the, the main database providers in the legal sphere. Um, but that is a concern is if this thing can produce a demand letter, what's my associate going to do? Or what is, you know, what is the new grad going to do? Um, but I like to step back and think that, you know, we've gone through similar things before. So again, using the example of legal research, um, I went to law school during a time where I had to do all of my research in print and research took days. <laughs> it took days to backdate a, a, a statute to the original uh, version of it. it. I mean, to do the entire process, it took you know, hours to what we call shepherdizing a case. So, or in Canada, we call noting up a case. So how is this important precedent of years ago interpreted today? Um, that, that is done in minutes now using our databases, but lawyers found other things to do and law librarians have absorbed other projects and other responsibilities. And I think Keith, it was you who said early on that, you know, individual staff and individual or, or individual institutions can take, can sort of break down the elements of the work that we do and try to get a sense of what is at risk, um, what is better and more efficiently done um, with some level of automation or, or AI generation, um, and what really needs that human expertise and that human creativity. So I, I will still, you know, I, this might be dated in a few months, but I still do maintain that generative AI is not yet creative. It still needs a human to spur anything that it creates. It's not doing anything on its own just yet. Um, but there is that still still that expertise. And, you know, I, I go back to the ethical issues of our knowledge helped to build some of these products. Um, but, you know, our knowledge is going to help implement them. And our expertise is going to help us define where we go next. I think using the tools in our work, I agree with Kareem, is, is where we are beginning. Um, but I, I do think that the concern is real and I sympathize with um, those folks who have, you know, in recent decades seen that seen their their jobs or their work change significantly and have to adapt to different ways of doing things like with tax preparation software on the market. You know, how many small um, tax preparers didn't have as much business as they used to. So, you know, they began to do other things. And um, so that is something that we as a profession, we as a as libraries, as institutions have to be thinking much more about too. Yes, thank you so much, Keith and Kareem and Kim for this really wonderful conversation. I'm seeing all in the chat and in the Q&A, we have lots of questions. I'm unfortunately not gonna be able to get to them all. And so Sabrina, I wanna to turn to you so that um, the ones that receive the most votes, we can pose those questions to our panelists. Sure. Yeah, thanks, Alexia, and thanks, everyone. Um, and I'll just remind viewers to like a question or submit it if you'd like. And it looks like our most popular question is from Catherine, who asks, how do you make AI tools available to students in an AI lab? Do they have to create their own accounts, or do you have institutional accounts for chat, GPT, et cetera? So a more practical question here. Yeah, who would like to answer that question first? Yeah, please go ahead, Keith. Sure, I, I actually had thought I was going to work out how to respond to that in the chat, but my technical skills were lacking. Um, we provide barred accounts for everyone at CMU. The, the, the one proviso is that Google, which owns Bard, requires anyone who has an account to be at least 18 years of age. But we are providing that as we use um, the, the Google suite for our campus mail and, and such things. So it's a, a very easy transition. Um, so we don't provide AI labs for that sort of purpose. We do have AI labs on campus, but those are really in our AI research centers. Uh, we have an undergraduate degree in artificial intelligence where they have some specialized facilities. And in our business school, there is an AI maker space that was opened a couple of years ago that is a, a university-wide resource. But in terms of LLMs, uh, the, the campus-wide access to BARD is the main thing that people are using. Okay, thank you. Um, does anyone else have any? Yeah, Kareem, go right ahead. 
Yeah, I, I would say pre-gen. So in the in my former um, AI lab, so we we offered really special accounts because we had an NVIDIA DGX supercomputer. Because typically, because those supercomputers were just for researchers, we want to democratize AI, so kind of encourage students to use them. And we have uh, also Lambda laptops optimized for AI. So this was very popular because basically, okay, get play with it and it's okay. Thank you. What's the next question, Sabrina, from our folks, which was that they vote up? Sure, yeah, a very po uh, popular question here is from Robin who asks, when commercial AI systems are trained on data that's full of questionable content, discriminatory, misinformation, et cetera, how do we responsibly and ethically help students, staff and faculty make, make the best possible use of flawed systems? Yeah, I wanna to toss that question to Kim. So I think, again, we have to get into awareness. Um, we may not understand, it may not be apparent to, to individual users how a system was built. So that's where I think, again, it is important for um, our students um, and our staff, our teams, to have an elemental understanding of how um, AI works. Um, it is, you know, so I, I do, I created a class that's been teaching for a couple of years now. Um, and this past semester, uh, semester, I did incorporate a chat GPT component in, into it, but it's on critically evaluating legal information. And um, in as part of the readings in that course, they do get uh, material that explains um, some of the concerns, the ethical and um, bias related concerns of the data that is building our systems. I think more and more people are becoming aware of it in terms of how they can use it. I think recognizing that the, they're not, the outputs are not going to be uh, perfect. And I, it's not apparent to everybody that the outputs aren't going to be perfect because it wasn't apparent to those who gathered and selected the data in all cases. Uh, other things that we can do as libraries are communicate with our vendors um, that are providing um, us with data driven products and ask them to clean them up and ask them to address some of our concerns about the quality of the data that has gone into them. And those, you know, things can be cleaned up. Um, if we are in a position to join a development team or to, to join a project or research, you know, faculty may be working on something to bring these concerns into, into play as well. And I think some universities or departments include uh, audits as part of a, the step of a research um, plan when a new product is being built, including that now following some ethical AI principles or responsible AI principles does require inclusion of those steps now. Um, so, you know, those are, I guess, the things being critical of the outputs, understanding what the inputs are um, or how we don't know what the inputs are very often and um, doing what we can to, to improve products, both existing ones and future ones. Thank you, Sabrina. I think we may have time for one more question. Sure. Um, let's see. Okay. Um, we have a question from Sarah who asks about accessibility and disability related issues. Um, so the question is, are you including accessibility and other disability related issues in your usage and teaching of AI? And uh, are disabled students and staff an active and vocal part of making sure AI is inclusive and ethical? Yeah, go ahead, Kareem. Yeah, good question. Y yes, absolutely. Actually, when we did survey with students and we had a couple of workshops, accessibility was top priority and we said, yes, absolutely. And they shared that with Gen AI opens up doors for them. So like in terms of speech to text, um, text to speech, and also the way you summarize text, and also the, the blank page and anxiety, where you feel like how I'm gonna start, they were so happy versus kind of skeptic say, no, 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 no. Yes, and it's kind of a de facto uh, must for, it's not just here, Stony Brook. I heard like other universities, 
where students may, were really vocal about uh, accessibility. Excellent. Thank you again so much for an engaging and wonderful webinar. Keith, Kim, and Kareem, what a fabulous dialogue. Thank you again for your time, sharing all your tips and tools and expertise. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Sabrina who will officially close our webinar for this afternoon. And many thanks to all of our participants and colleagues who signed on today. Thanks, Alexia. Yeah, I'll just echo you and say thanks so much to Kareem, Keith, Kim, and Alexia for taking the time to speak with us today. And thank you to our attendees for your engagement with your questions and your comments. I'd like to remind our viewers that we did record today's program, so be on the lookout for a follow-up email from Ty with a link to the recording. We'll also take a look at the chat and the Q&A and uh, compile a list of resources for you all. Uh, also, if you have a few minutes after the presentation to fill out a brief survey, we would really appreciate it. So thanks again to all of you out there for joining us. We hope you found the session informative and engaging, and we hope to see you again in the near future on another webinar. Thanks, everybody, and season's greetings to you all. Thank you.